Well, good morning. Welcome to Clear Lake Bible Church. I know this is weird. It's a little different because nobody else is here. It's just Kirk and I and Nathan. Nathan's here too. But we are very thankful that you are here with us as well and that we can worship our God and King together. Even though we are not together in the body, we are together with each other in spirit. And we're just so very thankful that we have the technology to still be able to minister to you as well as to ourselves um, and just worship the Lord together. So we have a selection of songs that we're going to sing to worship God this morning. But before we do that, I'd like to pray. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, we recognize you as sovereign. We recognize you as the one who cares for us and sees every detail of our lives, Lord. And we're thankful we can come to you with anything and everything. So we just pray as we sing your praises this morning um, that it would be a blessing to you and that you would hear us, Lord, and speak to our hearts in the midst of it. We trust you in the midst of such an uncertain time, knowing that everything is in your control, it's in your hands, and there's nothing that's surprising to you. We love you and thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's begin with worship, where we welcome the presence of the Lord singing, Here for You. Amazing one 
changing one to him the end come race lift up your hymns of the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus.
our judge and our defender suffered and crucified forgiveness is in you descended into darkness you rose in glorious life forever seated high I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son I believe in the Holy Spirit our God is three in one I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again for I believe in the name scripture reading this morning is from Titus chapter 2 verse 11. It says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Amen. We are blessed to be here and serving our Lord and our King and praising Him for all that He is and all that He's done for us. Um, Today we have our community groups online as we've had the last few weeks, but now they're exclusively online. So if you would like to join that, you can check your email for either Herman's group or Mr. Edgar's group. The emails for that the links for that will be in your email. Um, you can just go ahead and click one of those and join us there. Also, on our website, we have a list of different things that you can be a participant of. First and foremost is our prayer chain, as well as our CLBC news group. If you'd like to join either of those, you can just scroll down on our home page, and there will be a button on the left-hand side where you can click and join one or the other. We'll make sure you get approved. And then also, if you would like to give, there are instructions on how to give electronically on our website. So just follow the instructions there. It'll go through our financial team and we'll make sure that those funds are allocated accordingly to what our elders um, feel the Lord is leading us to allocate those funds to. Also, if you have prayer requests, feel free to email either myself or Miss Terry. Um, the email should be up on the screen um, right now. And if you'd like to submit any prayer requests, you can do so to either of us and we'll make sure that it gets to the prayer group and then sent out to the prayer chain. So before we continue on in worship, I'd like to close this part, our offering part, with the word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord Jesus, we recognize that all that we have and all that is in our possession has been given to us by you. Your word tells us that all good and perfect things come from you, and um, there's no shifting shadow with you, Lord. You are always good and you are always loving. So Father, we want to offer these things back to you 
to use it how you best see fit. May you just continue to be leading our elders um, with the finances and um, helping them to see the needs, Lord, and how they can best use the money to steward the advancement of your kingdom. Father, we also recognize that you are a God who hears our prayers and who receives them um, with all care and all love and will answer them to what you deem best, Lord. So we just pray for those prayer requests that are coming in. May we lift them up to you and entrust you with whatever your answer is, Lord, because we know you are good and your ways are higher than ours. So we submit ourselves to your will and pray that you would lead us accordingly. We love you so much and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Will you pray with me this morning? Father, you are Lord of all creation. You are God of heaven and earth, and we just, uh, we praise you this morning. You are worthy of our praise. Father, as we open up your word, uh, we just pray for your wisdom, for your guidance, for your direction, um, that you may draw us close to you, that we may know you more, that we may be better equipped to do your work and to pursue the good deeds that you've laid out for us. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to make that all possible. It's in his name we pray. Amen. So this morning, we uh, continue through our study of Titus. And we're in Titus chapter 2. And I'm just going to jump right into the text here this morning, because I think kind of partway through or towards the end of the the passage in Titus 2, he gives us the real crux of the passage. He gives us the big idea towards the bottom. And so I'm going to pick it up in verse 11 here. It says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly righteous and godly in the present age. In verse 13, Looking for the blessed hope in the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So we read that at the very beginning, and it's kind of partway through the chapter, but it gives us the big idea of what Paul is communicating to Timothy. This this whole concept that we are to deny the worldly desires, the ungodliness and that we are to pursue righteousness, that we are to pursue godliness, that we are to pursue, as it said in 13, that we are looking for the blessed hope. That, that's the big idea this morning. That's where we're going. How can we deny the worldly desires? How can we deny the ungodly and pursue righteousness, keeping focused on the blessed hope? I mean, that's something we all want to do. It's something that all of us understand. We can buy into that real easy, right? Just just from a conceptual standpoint, to understand the basic of the gospel, which he had in those passages, and, and to understand that we should flee the worldly desires and we flee the unrighteousness and we pursue, we pursue the blessed hope. We pursue righteousness. We, we can buy into that, right? The question that we're going to answer this morning is how do we do that? What does that look like in our lives? It's easy to say it and say, yes, I'm going to deny the things of the world and I'm going to pursue righteousness, but but it's kind of high thought. It's not where the rubber meets the road. How, How do I actually do that? Well, at the beginning of the chapter, if we jump back up to the top, he's going to give us some very specific instructions on how we can walk through and how we can deny the worldly, what what tools we have to deny the worldly desires, to deny ungodliness, and to pursue righteousness and stay focused on the blessed hope. Now, before I jump into that, when we stay focused on the blessed hope, I just want to kind of clarify that just a little bit. To be focused on the blessed hope is to understand that the world that I'm in now This world is temporary. This world will pass away. This world's days are numbered. And then I'm focused on the hope that is eternity. The hope is the salvation being saved from this fallen world to spend eternity with God, to spend eternity in the presence of the Father. That's the hope right? To to recognize that this world is fallen and to recognize that where I'm headed 
is to spend eternity with him. That, that's the desire, right? We, we have that desire. And so I want to stay focused on that, on that blessed hope. Now, when we look at our current world, it, it, I think it's coming easier and easier to do that. Because the more we look at our world, the more we realize our world is crazy. We, I, in our nation especially, I feel like we have collectively lost our minds. And, and so it becomes more easy, or it comes easier for us to deny the worldly desires because the world isn't as appealing as it maybe once was. And to focus on the, on the hope to come, to focus on eternity and being with God becomes a little bit easier because the world isn't as appealing. And, and so for us now, as our nation struggles and as there's chaos and turmoil, there becomes a little bit more of a desire for something better, for something greater. You know, our nation spent years upon years, really probably since World War II, where we've enjoyed a great prosperity. I don't know that that's the healthiest thing for the church. Really, it makes sense for us if we think about the church thrives during persecution. And that's a reality when we look back in the past. And when the church has been heavily persecuted, the church has flourished. And so we shouldn't fear persecution as a church. And I think some of that may be because when the church is persecuted, the world becomes less desirable. And it becomes more desirable for us to look to the hope that God has for us, to look towards eternity because we realize that this world has fallen. So the church in itself should never fear, should never fear persecution because when we're persecuted, it reminds us that this world is not my home, that I have something greater to come. So how do I continue to look at the hope, to pursue righteousness, and to deny the worldly desires? So let's go back up. Chapter 2, verse 1. We'll start from the very beginning. It says, But as for you, and this is Paul speaking to Titus. He's giving Titus instruction on what he's to do. So, but as for you, Titus, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. So he wants Titus to instruct, to give uh, sound doctrine and sound teaching to the people in Crete. And then he goes through, and we'll see five different categories of people as we walk through here. All right? He starts off with older men. It says, older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. And so he gives some pretty understandable things that the older men are to do, that they're supposed to be sensible, that they're supposed to be dignified, sound in faith, right? That they understand what it is to follow after Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, it says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So it starts off, it sounds like, well, that, that's kind of harsh. You know, he's picking on the older women there, that they shouldn't be gossips and enslaved to wine. But, but here's what's happening. It, their society, very similar we can probably even relate to this and, and some people in a sense in our society, but the women primary responsibility at the time in this society was to raise the children and to take care of the home. Well, once they raise their children and their children become adults, in a big sense, that job is done. And so they have this opportunity to sit around and have more time and the potential to become the gossip or to to drink lots of wine and be addicted to that. And so he's warning them against this idleness that could come. And then he tells, this is what you need to do, that the older women need to teach what is good. Now that, that becomes pretty important for us, to know that they are called upon, that the, that the mature women in the body are called upon to instruct to give sound teaching, to teach, just as Titus was to see, teach the sound doctrine, that they would also teach what is good, to teach the sound doctrine. So he's told to instruct the older men and the older women, and, and, but he's not the only one doing the instruction. Being Titus is not the only one doing the instruction. But that the older women are to teach also. It goes on in verse 4. So that they may encourage the young women, to love their husbands. So the, the teaching of the older women, naturally, probably the biggest beneficiary there is the younger women. 
that they would be encouraged. They would be encouraged to love their, encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. All right, so when we read that passage, there's some obvious good things in there that the younger women are to be encouraged by the older women and that the older women are going to teach the younger women and that the younger women need to be pure and to love their children and to love their wives. These are good things, right? We, un- we understand these are good things. Now, we also could potentially have people pick out this verse and say, well, this, this is what women should always do, that they are to stay home and raise the children and keep the house. And guys, I don't think that's what it's saying at all. Now, I'm going to put it off for just a minute. I'm going to come back to this verse. I think it's really important. But right now, I want us to see that he was instructing the, the older men, the older women, the younger women, and, and in just a minute, the younger men, and that they are also instructing one another as well. All right, so that, that's what we're going to see at first. I'm going to come back to this idea of the younger woman and what they're called to do. Don't lose me on that, all right? Don't think, oh, Kirk, I can't believe you're doing this passage. No, no, let me come back to that, all right? I will. All right, he goes on in verse 8. I'm sorry, uh, in verse 6. Likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. He uses that word sensible a number of times in, in the book. And it's funny because I look at our country and I think we have lost all sense. But he uses this word sensible, that we would urge the young men or teach the young men to be sensible in all things. Show yourself to be example of good deeds with purity in doctrine. And we see that purity of doctrine again. Now, he's talking, I think, specifically to Titus there. um, Because he says, show yourself, right, to be an example of good deeds with purity of doctrine, dignified and sound, sound in speech which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. That's the whole idea of being above reproach, that no one could have anything bad to say about us. And we talked about it a little bit in in the last chapter. He goes on in verse 9. He says, Urge or teach the bond slaves to be subject to their own masters in everything, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith, so that they will adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. Now there again, a, a passage that may be a stumbling block for people. Is he, is he saying slavery is okay because he tells the slave to obey his master and to work heartily for his master? I don't think that's what he's saying at all. And I'm, I'm going to come, come back to that one as well. So both of those we're going to come back to in, in just a minute. But first I want to I pull out two points, and then the final one's going to wrap all this together, Okay. So the first thing that we look at, we see all these different groups of people, the older men, the younger men, the older women, the younger men, the slaves, the five different groups of people. There's a common thread through all of them. That common thread is that they are all to be instructed so that they may grow in the faith, so that they may understand the doctrine. It's common for for all five groups, right, that they are to be taught, that they are to understand the message of the gospel, to understand the word of God, so that they may grow in spiritual maturity. It's not anything new. I mean, if we, if we consider our, our culture, and we consider not just our culture now, but going back over the last hundreds and thousands of years, it's always been true that if you want to learn about something, what do you do? Well, you go to somebody that knows how to do that well. And when you go to somebody that knows how to do that well, then then you're able to learn from them. So if you want to be a carpenter, you go to the master carpenter and you you take an apprenticeship, right? It's been that way for for a long time. And and even today, it's not really any different. If you want to be an engineer, what do you do? Well, you you go to a school and you find some professors that are going to teach you about math and chemistry and and engineering, and, and you learn And then when you come out and you're 22 years old and you have your engineering degree, you don't go run your company. You go take a job and hopefully you have somebody 
that is a, an experienced engineer that can build into you a little bit and show you the ropes and you can grow in, in understanding what it is to be an engineer, right? It works the same way. When, when I thought about going into the ministry, I didn't just pop right in and, and all of a sudden I was ready. I, I first went to seminary and I studied and I found people that could teach me, I found people at the seminary, the professors that could teach me about Greek and Hebrew and Old Testament studies and New Testament studies and about systematic theology and eschatology and soteriology and kind of go, the list goes on and on and on. But I found people that could teach and build into me. And then when I was done with that formal training, I still went and found, in fact, somebody told me early on, said, if you can find somebody that has done well in ministry, that has served well and is willing to build into you, then what you need to do is go camp out on their doorstep and just soak in all that you can. And so I, I took that to heart. And I've been at multiple different places where I've had the benefit of senior pastors that would build into me and, and really teach and help grow me and really took an interest in my development, right? And so if I want to grow and become better and be effective in ministry, then I find somebody that's gone before me and that has done that. And Growing in the Word is the same thing for all of us. If I want to grow in spiritual maturity, I go and I find somebody that, it, that I see as spiritually mature, and I get them to mentor me. I get them to build into me. In fact, that's the first idea. If I'm going to be successful in fleeing the ungodliness, in fleeing the worldly desires, in pursuing righteousness, the first thing I need to do is to go and find somebody that will build into me, that will mentor me, that will grow me, that will help me in that spiritual development. It's the consistent thread that we see throughout all five categories. They were all taught. They were all brought along. It's true for all of us. As a body of believers, we should be looking for people that will build into our lives and help us grow. Here's the second part of it, though. Titus wasn't the only one doing the teaching, right? Titus did teach, and Titus was called on to have sound doctrine. But we see very specifically that the older women were to teach also, to teach what is good for the benefit of. And it, we see it, I think, with the older men and the younger men as well, that they were called to instruct each other. So here's the thing. We don't stop. Or we don't simply say, well, I need to find somebody to build into me. That's only half of it. We also need to be willing ourselves to give our time and our energy to build into the next person, to build into somebody else, right? And that's exactly what it is. Sometimes we get this concept of, well, if I'm going to mentor somebody, I'm going to have them come up and I'll have them sit down in the chair and, and you sit down and you be quiet and, and I'm going to mentor you and I'm going to tell you what you need to know. This is not how it works at all, right? That, that's not it. If we're going to mentor somebody, we need to realize that it is not about us. It's about coming along somebody else, alongside somebody else and helping them grow in their relationship with God. But we are called to be willing to do that, to make that sacrifice of time, to make that sacrifice of energy, to give towards somebody else's spiritual growth. We are called to do that. So those are the first two things that I think are common with all five of the groups, that we are called to find a mentor and we're called to be willing to be a mentor, all right? As a body of believers, that we should actively practice those things, that we should actively look for people that are spiritually mature, that we can learn from and be willing to sacrifice our time and energy to the benefit of somebody else. Now, here's the last thing. If I'm going to be successful in sacrificing my time and energy for the benefit of somebody else, to mentor somebody else, I have to understand that it's not about me. And that is so key. And it's a theme that we see in this passage, that it's not about me, right? It's not about you. We find the mentor, we're willing to mentor someone else, and we realize that it is not about us. Here's what I mean by that. Let's go back to this idea of, uh, of him instructing the slave, right? He tells, 
he tells the, the slave that he should serve his master well. If I'm going to sum that up a little bit. He tells the slave, serve your master well. Here's what he's not doing. He's not giving us instruction on how society should be structured. Right? He, he's not doing that at all. He's not saying to own a slave is good. He's not saying that, that there are some people that will own other people. He, he's not proposing that. What he is doing is saying that is a reality of the society that he is writing to. There were slaves in the time that he's writing to. And so he's saying, look, if you are a slave, this is the way that you honor God and focus on the kingdom. He's not saying it's good. He's not saying people should. So it's nothing about structuring society. He's not saying this is what society should do. He's saying as an individual, what you should be focused on is how can I honor the kingdom? In other words, it's not about us. It's not about you. It's about the kingdom. And if I'm going to be focused on how I can benefit the kingdom of God, then I set my own self aside and I flee the worldly desires and I flee the ungodliness and I pursue righteousness and I keep focused on the blessed hope. Not the here and now, not this world. I'm not trying to build a better home here because this world is not my home. I'm focused on the blessed hope. I'm focused on the kingdom. How can I benefit the kingdom? That becomes the question. And, and that's what he's instructing to. And really, guys, it's the same thing when he talks to the young women. He tells the young women, you should raise your kids well that you should love your husband, that you should take care of the home. It's not, it's not a restriction. In our society today, um, it, it's not an instruction whether or not a young mother should go to work and have a career or stay home. That, that's a struggle we have a lot these days. This passage, let me be clear, it doesn't really address that. It's not talking about Just like it's not really talking about slavery, it's not talking about whether a mom should stay home or work outside of the home. What it is saying is in the culture that he's writing to, the young women didn't have other options. Their job was to stay home and to raise the kids. And so his instruction is, do that in a way in which God will be glorified to benefit the kingdom, right? Raise your kids, love your husband, take care of the home in a way in which God will be glorified and the kingdom will be praised. That's the instruction. It's not saying this is how society should operate. It's saying this is the reality of how this particular society in Scripture did operate. And within the confines of that society, we should do whatever we can to glorify God and to glorify the kingdom and work for the kingdom. So really, they're similar, and it's true for all of us. When we consider this world, this world is not my home. This world is fallen. This world is temporary. This world is lost. This world's days are numbered. They will end. Sometimes I look around and I think, well, that might be sooner than later. I don't, I don't know. But the, the days are numbered in this world. What we need to look for is the blessed hope. And when I can serve God well, when I can glorify the kingdom, as opposed to grabbing anything that's good for me here, when I can set aside the selfishness and not serve myself but serve the kingdom, what it allows me to do is allow the gospel message to be shown through my life so that so that forgiveness, so that love, so that grace and mercy of Jesus Christ can be shown through my life. And then, maybe some of these people that are around me, that are in this fallen world that is doomed, may be saved as well and join me in the blessed hope. Join me in heaven. Join me in being able to spend eternity with God. See, that's the goal. The goal isn't to fix this world. And, and let me be real clear here. The goal is not to fix this world 
The goal is to save people from this world. That's salvation. That we are to be saved from a world that is doomed, right? That we are called to stay focused on the blessed hope. That we are called to live in whatever situation we're given, that we live out being an advocate for Christ. That people may see the grace and the love of Him through us. That we're focused on the kingdom that we're focused on how I can take people with me through the blood of Jesus Christ to be saved in eternity with God forever. That's the focus. That's what we're called to do. So when we look at the passage and we come back to to the very crux of it there, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope, when he calls us to do that, the way in which we do it is together, as a body of Christ, being willing to go out and look for somebody to build into me at the same time that I'm looking to build into somebody else. So to have a mentor, to be willing to be a mentor, to teach, that we do this together, building each other up, encouraging each other, and to recognize that it's not about me, and it's not about what I can build for myself but it's about the kingdom. It's about being focused on the blessed hope. It's about the salvation that Jesus Christ has offered me and offered to everybody else and me being able to share it with them so that they may join me in that eternity with Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, you are Lord of all creation. You are a God of heaven and earth, and we just praise you. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you give us through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the the knowledge that we have that it's not about how good we are, about our ability to earn our way in, but that you have sacrificed your Son, Jesus Christ, for my sins and for all of our sins and given us that choice to follow after you, to choose you, to seek you, to draw close to you, to be a child of yours. Father, we just pray that we can remember and have the strength and the wisdom to know that this world is not our own, but that you have one planned for us. You have one built for us and that we long to be there with you for all eternity. But Lord, while we are here, we just pray that you would give us the strength and the boldness to live for you, to live for your kingdom, to share your love and your grace and your mercy. Father, we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. Would you join us for this last song as we celebrate our King of Kings together? In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt.
In the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, for the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead were from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. Thank you guys so much for tuning in with us, uh, for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, We appreciate just the opportunity that technology offers us to be able to connect, even though we're distant apart, but to be able to connect, to study God's Word together, to be able uh, to worship together. Uh, We're going to have our community groups here shortly, so tune in with one of those online. Um, We're really glad that you were here. Let's pray. Father, we just, uh, we thank you for a great morning to worship you. Lord, we just ask that as we... um, go out from here that we would be drawn by you to do your work, to be zealous for your good deeds. Lord, that you would give us the strength and the wisdom and the boldness to live a life, to serve you, and to glorify you in all we do. Lord, we pray this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week.